I have the great privilege to introduce to you Travis today. Um, Travis has authored and led the creation of industry cornerstones such as NumPy, SciPy, NumPy, and Conda, and uh, of course also the PyData conference series. So thank you for making this possible. Um, Travis also founded Anaconda, so after I knew all of that, I was like, I don't know if Travis has ever slept, but... <laughs> um, with current side, Travis has also assembled some of the top talent in the industry, and I'm sure he's going to talk about that today. And uh, some fun fact about Travis, because I was going around some friends, I was like, do you know Travis? Like, do you have anything I can share that's you know, fun about him? And he's like, apparently Travis is well known for being a great singer, so I don't know if he's going to demonstrate the skill sets today, but it's up to him if he wants to wrap up with that. And also, late but not least, Travis is also someone who is well known for staying up late at night during Akaton, for example, at the <laughs> Akaton, Illinois. That's a fun fact from Carl Willing, who hack around with you on Jupiter and NumPy at 3 a.m. with students. And she said she had a blast doing it and always having fun hacking with you on projects. So please, everyone, welcome Travis. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, and thank you to the conference organizers and the invitation to come and speak. This is a phenomenal event. Thank you for getting up and uh, attending the, uh, the, talk, the early talk. Uh, I know sometimes we probably had a late night parties last night. I, heard, I was hearing rumors about people at different events. Uh, so appreciate you being here. Uh, I've been coming to, to community events for a long time. I really find energy and I love coming to here. I, I, I wanted to give a little, a tiny bit of retrospective about kind of where we came from and then why we're doing it, and maybe what's what kind of some of the things I'm doing now. Hopefully, uh, you'll see a little bit about what you're going to do and what what the work you're doing in kind of what I'm doing. If there's anything that's been driving me for 30, 25, 28 years now, as I've been uh, uh, working on this community and working on the software that drives us, it's uh, really the potential, the potential to really uh, build something that matters build something that lasts, build something that uh, brings us together and kind of crosses the borders, the, the separation between us and, just, and brings us together. Um, there's tremendous opportunity, tremendous power still. I mean, it may seem like everything's been done, may seem like lots has happened. It's amazing how much opportunity there still is, like regardless. Um, so if anything, you see people out there doing great work, you see, man, I wish I could do that, I wish there was something I would be doing that's related to that. Just know that it's there, and if you want to talk to somebody about it, happy to talk to you about possibilities, happy to talk to you about ways to get started, ways to kind of find your own vision, find your own story. So the first PyData workshop was in 2012. This was basically at the uh, peak Hadoopla, essentially, and everyone was excited about scalable data, and Python was just not talked about much. And you know, Peter and uh, Wes and uh, Fernando and others, we, uh, Stefan, got together and we're saying, hey, we've got to do something. We've got to, we've got to promote Python for data as well. So we inaugurated this PyData workshop. Several people helped us bring it together. Google allowed us to do it at the Googleplex. We went with Guido there. We've been doing this for 11 years. And then, of course, it's blossomed and grown. It was amazing just how much interest there was in this kind of gathering, this kind of enth enthusiasm. And it just took off. Thousands of people have contributed. I was just visiting with the volunteers this morning who, was show, who show, showed up to kind of help organize PyData here. It's amazing. It seems like everywhere, every part of the world you do that, there's, there's people that want to help, people that will do it. And that's been happening for 11 years. The movement actually started 10 years before that. So, you know, PyData in 2012, it had already been 10 years, the SciPy conference. And I think I heard you learn some of this history before. But I went back to try, when was that actually happening? It was September 5th of 2002. I remember that gathering in Pasadena. There were only 70 folks. And there was this nice write-up by, by somebody. I mean, um, actually commenting, talking, discussing, you know, if, you, if you're looking for something to do, write a blog about what you experienced today, here today. You know, do that. Talk about what you're seeing. Give your perspective. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to contribute and to help people make sense of this uh, phenomenal movement we call open source community activity uh, that just is, is the sum of all of us. And it's amazing what can happen if we are kind of doing it with good intentions, doing it, good, doing it with a heart of service, with a desire to help each other, with a desire to give. When that happens, it's amazing what's produced. And everything that you see in the Python ecosystem is really coming from that, uh, from that spirit, from that space. So this happened in 2002. Um, but it actually started even earlier than that. <laughs> it started really, I think, uh, when Guido wrote Python, he started in 1989, 
first released in 91, the first version came out in 94. I started using Python in 98. Uh, any, show of hands, anybody started using Python before 1998? I know there's probably somebody here. No, no, I'm the oldest one? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm with Python 1.4.2. Um, but 95, this is the thread, this is the matrix sig thread that was active when I showed up on the scene, right? So what got me excited was there was already people gathering. Now the watering hole back then was a mailing list. And you can go to the archives here and see it, mail.python.org still holds these archives. You can go back and read through these messages that people just posted to an email. That was the way we communicated. There was no Facebook, there was no Instagram, there was no Snapchat, no TikTok. We communicated by writing messages on email and hoping we weren't offending somebody which we didn't always do. We often offended people. Uh, you know, we got used to how do we write, and we didn't use emojis very often, so often things were misinterpreted. But there was a lot of, you could see, even then there was this passion, there was this desire to build something. And uh, you know, Jim Huguenin was there, the very first one, Jim Fulton, um, Matrix Sig, 1995. So this SciPy data community, and forgive me for kind of inventing a concept here, but um, SciPy data community has been going for 28 years. Uh, and this is just one event from 2009, actually, that Gael had, had posted. I think he circled himself in that picture. So we've had almost 30 years of innovation, coming together, building, creating something. Something for experts, something for science, something for people that want to use software to better the world. Um, we're not there yet. Right? Actually, I don't think we're even that close. I'm excited by what's coming out and what's possible. I think there's enormous innovations that have been occurring that will enable us to accelerate this, 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 this organization. Here's just a couple of things that I still think about that we need, that we, that we needed then, we still need now. There's work to do to accomplish these things. Thriving open source communities, and thriving means they're welcome. There's lots of people in them. People aren't feeling, they're still, you know, it's hard to get into them sometimes. There's a lot of people who are eager to kind of learn, but they don't know exactly where to start. Um, so how do you enable these sustainable thriving? Now, how to help them sustain? There's a lot of work there to still do. Uh, I have this concept I call open source aligned businesses. In some sense, that's what I've been really doing for the past 15 years, is trying to figure out how to create and work with and partner with and organize open source aligned businesses. And I think the possibilities are enormous there, actually. If we open and, and just, just think about the possibilities for alignment and possibilities, and we recognize the critical nature of cooperation at scale, and the critical nature that business actually plays in cooperation at scale, and don't see it as a, as a bad thing, see it as a good thing. But just there are bad ways to do it, just like there are bad ways to interact in the community, there are bad ways to do business. But there are great ways to do business, and there are great ways to interact with the community as well. Then more specifically, you know, software that allows experts in other fields, which many of us are. Most people in the PyData community, you're, you're here because you're an expert in some other field. You've studied science, you've studied engineering, you've studied data, you've, um, you've studied medicine. Uh, I don't know if we have any, uh, we probably have some medical professionals, but not necessarily you know, physicians here. How do you help us, who have these other desires, other interests, use and direct computational resources without sacrificing performance. How do we do it easily? We still struggle with that. Like we still, you know, these new innovations occur, awesome, we can take advantage of GPUs, but coding them is terrible. You know, how do, we can take advantage of these wonderful clusters of machines, but coding them is challenging. Some of these problems are, are real, and they're still here, absolutely still here. And they've been here for a long time. So there's plenty of opportunity to make it better if we keep focused on what are we trying to accomplish? What do we try to help? Uh, another thing that, I, ever since I became aware of this problem, I'm not particularly a visualization expert myself, but I've been around others who are, and I've seen, oh, this is absolutely what I want. I want other people want it too. People want live dashboards and visualizations. We, we can create them in lots of ways today, but they're kind of you know, contained. How do you make a visualization so it's always active, it's always live, it's always able to, to just receive the data, there's lots of problems there. I mean, you go dig deep into that problem, you realize, okay, there's more than just uh, technology here. There's also who get. I mean, how do you update the data? What happens when it changes? How is the data collected? There's all kinds of questions there. Uh, how do you actually accomplish this? But I know that every, a lot of people want this. Like every business I go into, this is essentially, they love it if you give them a dashboard or you give them a visualization or a way to go from, here's what I'm trying to accomplish, here's my data, here's the result that we can make decisions around. And then, of course, the ability to share and reproduce these systems we produce, these systems easily, fluidly, that's still a challenge today, uh, despite you know, many years, you know, 
several decades of work by many people trying to make it better, and there are better solutions than there were 20, 20 years ago, it's still not done. There's still lots of opportunity to improve this question of how do we reproduce software that helps people accomplish their goal besides computers. You know, we love computers, I love computers, but you know, frankly, life is more than computers, right? Hopefully all of you have interests outside of this. All of you have interests that you're trying to accomplish, and how do we use computers to help us accomplish those things? Lots of possibilities. I like to show this slide almost just to orient me. You know, actually, you know, just, oh my gosh, what's, what, we've been doing a lot of things for a long time um, with a lot of people, uh, all the way since 91 to till today. And, uh, you know, people have seen this, a lot of things I've done in the past. I want to talk today a little bit about things. I'll talk a little bit about what, what, kind of how I oriented, but mostly about what I'm doing today, and then a little bit about where I think we can go and how, how do we go better. So I, I like to show this slide because it emphasizes a very important concept, which is it matters that you share what you're doing. And, you know, I'm sure Michael Miller does, I, I've actually never met him again. <laughs> Michael Miller wrote Table.io, released to the web, just was out there. When I searched for it, I was a young graduate student. I wanted to read a DICOM format, which is a medical imaging format, so I could read MRI images. I was trying to do processing with them. How do I do this? I just found Numeric and Python, and I liked it. I'd spent a year doing it. I actually started in 97, but a year later, I realized I could still read the code. I said, I've got to get into this more. That was a different experience than I'd had with Perl. Um, I could read what I wrote, and I said, I should play with this a little more, actually. So then I, I got into it. I said, well, well, I need to read data, so how do I do that? Well, I can write some C code. And back in the day, extending Python was writing C code, basically. And that's what we've been doing in the SciPy data community for years, is not you know, writing Python code and wishing it were faster. We've been writing extension modules. Now in Cython and Numba, you can do the same thing. We're writing C code to make it fast, and then using Python as glue. As, as scripting over uh, outer, outer layer glue. A lot of conversations around Python completely miss the point. They, they, they sort of, Python's slow, you can't do this, you can't do that. Like, that's not what we've been doing. You know, look deeper, look at what's happening actually. We've been using the expressivity of Python to steer our large codes, which are still backed by low level libraries. Now recently, past 10 years or so, we've been able to even write fast code with higher level syntax. I think there's a lot of ways to go still there. But because Michael Miller put his stuff, I did what I, I don't mind if you do, cut and paste programming. Sometimes we laugh, but that's what we're all doing. Now with ChatGPT, we're doing it in spades, right? We just cut and paste what it produces. Now, I, I will caveat, it's not unthinking cut paste programming, right? In fact, when you have a piece of code that you're cutting in and, and using to help develop your, your story, the, the thinking just begins. Right, you, now you have to debug, you have to adapt, you have to review. It's not just fire and forget. It's, oh, thank you for the help getting me started, getting me out of my fuzz of I don't know what to do. Let me start someplace. Now I have to iterate and have to work hard. But I appreciated that. It gave me something to start with, and I you know, took everything, and everything that's wrong with it was my fault. NumPyO released 98. And I just put it out there on the net. said, you know, hoped it was a tarball. It wasn't easy to install. An easy install came much later. It was a source code. You had to download it, install it, compile it. And so, you know, the, it, its distribution was limited to about four people. <laughs> uh, it wasn't until you get binary installations, people realize, okay, this really matters. Um, but then also, Guido had written a really good essay on how to reference, how do you handle reference counting. Because a lot of people complain about writing extension modules because you have to count references. It's actually pretty, pretty significant. If you, oh, if you don't, you leak memory. It's kind of an approach to doing that, a way to think about it. I read that essay, kind of grokked it, got, got the idea, and then um, you know, got better at it over time. I made a lot of mistakes, but you know, just documentation, <laughs> communicating about what you've done, which is always an opportunity. I guarantee every single open source project out there, no matter how mature, the maintainers would appreciate improved and better documentation on some segment. Documentation and testing. So this led directly to SciPy. Like, SciPy exists because this and you know, other people who contributed to SciPy doing something similar. Now SciPy, very ambitious. So definitely <laughs> one of my uh, weaknesses, I suppose, is I'm always looking big. <laughs> and you know, kind of you know, um, probably taking on more than I can handle. Right? Always punching above what I, what, what, what I probably should be doing. But uh, I can't help it. <laughs> I'm just, you know, once you see something, you want something to, to exist so badly, you just push at it, and you try to do everything you can to make it exist. SciPy was the, was the first example. So SciPy started as, you know, we wanted to be everything. We wanted to be open source, all the things. All the, all the things you might want to do as a scientist in one 
easy to install package. Now, what we didn't realize is essentially because the install problems of Python, you had to install one exe, basically. SciPy was actually our very first distribution of Python. It was masquerading as a library, it was really just a distribution of a bunch of libraries. And what became challenging is managing SciPy um, with like four people, right? And, and not only just the fact that all of us couldn't, we had, we had to collect like thousands more people. Like we need to organize thousands, thousands more people and there's real problems with that. There's problems not only of communication scale, like how do you actually have a team meeting when you've got thousands of contributors? Like you all tried Zoom, we've all gotten really good at Zoom these past few years, right? But on a Zoom meeting, how many people before you stop being able to really have a collaborative conversation, it's just more speaking at people. Like you can speak at lots of people with Zoom, but how do you speak with people? It's hard. So SciPy, we had that problem early on in about 2004 or five, we kind of recognized this and some smart people decided, hey, we should do some scikits. And the scikit phenomenon emerged and scikit-learn, which is the single most popular scikit likely, emerged from that kind of realization. We can't put all the things in SciPy even though it's a nice distribution. But that's essentially why you know, a scientist trained in medical physics ended up founding a company that became known for distributing Python binaries, right? Basically, like, how did that happen? Right, it's, it's this, it's sci-fi, it's because, you know, just trying to help people, just trying to get stuff installed. Now, a lot of people know me for NumPy, not realizing that sci-fi came first. Sci-fi came first and NumPy it was actually written to save sci-fi. It was written to kind of help the community keep together. It was a fledgling community. I didn't, I, I really, really was pained to see that libraries were being written for another array object and you had to copy the data from one array to another. There wasn't an easy way to exchange data at the time. Uh, so NumPy was written. Also, I became a Python core developer and, and improved the buffer protocol. So the memory view object and the buffer protocol in Python was, I contributed that at the same time. Uh, memory view object itself was improved by Antoine and Stefan later. So, because um, it was barely functional after I left it. But the buffer protocol, I wanted to make sure the structure, so you know, there's an old, old adage of fix it twice. When you see a problem, you fix the proximal problem, like the immediate problem, but then the ultimate problem, can you fix that too? So to avoid the problem in the future. So I felt like we, we at least did that here. Wrote NumPy to merge the libraries together, but also wrote a buffer protocol so that even when new array libraries may arise in the future, they would at least be able to share data so you wouldn't have to copy data back and forth. So that's kind of how I got started. Uh, and, and many of you heard, know the story of Anaconda, and, and Peter may say more today. But today, I'm going to talk more about what I'm doing today and kind of the efforts we're involved with today. Essentially, I'm looking to help people still. I'm just scratching my own itch and my own desire to see the world a better place, to see these technologies improve. And no, I can't do it myself, right? So if I can't do it myself, I can't just sit and code all day and have something that I'm, I'm happy with. So what do I do? And so I spend a lot of time finding people finding money, finding business ideas, cooperating with folks, um, you know, tech visionaries, founders, investors, partners, people to work with to try to, uh, who are aligned with me, kind of open source aligned people to create this community driven open source um, world that I'd like to see. And these are just some of the efforts here that are happening. Um, so many people know the story of Anaconda and if you don't, come talk to me. I'm happy to talk to you about it in some depth. But I thought I'd start with where I, you know, leaving Anaconda. Uh, I left Anaconda because of some investor difficulties, essentially. And if you want to understand the details, um, happy to talk about it, not here. <laughs> uh, fortunately, Anaconda is in is fantastic hands now. Those, those difficulties are done. And Anaconda is doing very, very well, led by Peter with the same vision, the same energy, and even better, uh, and, the same, and better vision, and doing wonderful things. They've got great leaders over there. Uh, so I can't speak highly enough about Anaconda today. Uh, but at the time, was struggling uh, under different investors, <laughs> and so I left because I couldn't. I, I have a bigger, a bigger purpose in mind. I started Anaconda to try to create a company that would create products that would drive revenue to open source. So I'm very grateful for the Anaconda dividend program. Essentially, that's a, a very valuable tool. I'm very grateful that Anaconda sponsored NumFocus, that we were able to incubate it and, lay, and, and hire early people in NumFocus to get it started. Very grateful that NumFocus has been continuing to blossom under community leadership. But I left with uh, a couple of folks, Matt Harward, Ashley Ball, to start Quantsight. So Quantsight is, you know, and this is started as a, it's consulting and labs. One of the really critical things, and one of the things I'm really proud of is we do have a Quantsight Labs. 
long, long ago as NumPy and SciPy were created after uh, six years, eight years of Anaconda, we're, we're going, okay, the purpose, uh, the reason I left academia to go into business was to be able to support NumPy and SciPy. Like, that's why I did it, because I thought we need entrepreneurship, we need aligned businesses, maybe I should go try to help. Because there wasn't funding for NumPy and SciPy, but I wanted these to get funded, so how do we do that? So, you know, when Quantsite started, we're, Anaconda was doing wonderful things, but still not paying people to work on NumPy and SciPy directly. So one of the real purposes of, of, of Quantsite was to create a labs that would pay people and hire people to work on open source uh, uh, at least half their time, uh, half time to full time. So these are, and, and we do that partly by having a consulting mission that drives revenue, that drives, we help people use the tools more effectively and solve business problems, which there are many, lots of wasted money in companies. <laughs> and some of you know what I'm talking about. Still today, lots of people spending lots of money usually hiring teams of developers inefficiently and effectively, but um, not using open source enough, and we can, I, I'm happy to talk about ways to improve those situations in your organization. Uh, we do that consulting, to, and part of that funds this labs. Then this other thought occurred, and the reason I started a venture fund was because I saw a way to actually have all, open, have all companies contribute to the benefit of all open source. That idea is still percolating, but the Quantsa Initiate is actually doing pretty well. We've, got, we've invested in 14 companies. So these are all together. We have our values here. This is kind of taken from some slides from the deck. Uh, I won't bore you there. Um, this is kind of how we're organized. Effectively, we have the consulting division, we have the labs division, then we have people managers, effectively. Um, there is a concept called open teams. Now, open teams, I'll, you'll hear a little bit about. I'll go into some conversation, because it is what I'm spending at least half my time on today is something called Open Teams. And Open Teams is essentially a support organization to help support people like Quantsite Labs, people like Quantsite, others out there who want to do something similar. We feel like we can scale the success of Quantsite and Quantsite Labs to thousands more people. And so we want to help them. We want to help you do that. So uh, we basically have divided into these three camps, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, if you haven't yet, go download the Quantsite Labs annual report. So proud of these folks. And this is Rolf. I'll go back here to the, to the top. Rolf Gomers, uh, and Tanya Allard are co-directors of the labs, and everything good that's happening at Quantsite Labs is attributable to these folks. So I, you know, the only thing I can take credit for is trying to find the money and then convincing Rolf to come start it and, try to, and, then, and trying to run interference and then pulling Matt in to help me, um, who's, a, who's, some, who's often a better empath and a better uh, facilitator of, of difficult conversations. So that's something I take credit for, but uh, they've done amazing work, and uh, I'm inspired every day by the work they do. So if you haven't yet, uh, go read this lab report. It's uh, Pavitra, Pavitra uh, uh, wrote about this on the blog. Go to quantsite.org, labs.quantsite.org slash blog. Read the annual report. Um, you can get a picture, and, and imagine a world where there's hundreds of these. And what we did with our venture fund is we've actually committed 15% of any carried interest. If you know what that is, it's fine. But every single venture fund out there is making a ton of money on open source. Not all of them are making a ton of money, but several do make a lot of money. They should all be sponsoring open source research labs. There is no reason not to. They should all be funding open source research labs. It's an obvious, obvious pattern. It's not hard to do. And so if anything, I'd love that pattern to be, to be you know, shared, spread. In fact, some people said, hey, you should, be a venture, you, you should be just a venture investor. I said, that's fantastic. Find me a venture fund that will do this that will give its carried interest to an open source research lab, and you'll have my ear, right? I'm eager to, I'm eager to join. Um, we founded Fair OSS. It's currently um, incubating. It's, it's there. I love this idea, frankly. If I could do nothing else, if someone said, here's, here's uh, you don't have to work anymore, here's retirement, and you can just focus on one thing, I would focus on this. Uh, we found a way, I think we found a way that would sustain all of open source. We just have to convince every company to give a portion of its uh, revenue or a portion of its equity to the open source communities they depend on. And we figured a way to do it actually with a specific instrument that, and a specific organization, um, kind of a derivative instrument. Uh, you know, after years of working in the finance industry, working in open source, working in you know, business, I, I believe we figured out a way to do this. And we've sampled it, a few people have committed to do it. I, this will totally work, but it'll take you know, five to 10 years. And so I've got to find a pocket of money that can sustain at least half a million dollars a year for five to 10 years in order to really push on this. So if any of you have any, uh, you know, if you're looking, you have two and a half million or $5 million, you're looking just to put on something that's incredibly important, 
that could transform and create a trillion dollar um, uh, uh, exchange, essentially. There's an incredible idea here, and I'd love to talk to you about it. We're looking for leaders and investors to make this really happen. So, you know, I'm patient, right? It took uh, 17 years for SciPy to reach 1.0. Uh, I was, I left academia because I didn't publish enough. I, my, my papers were unknown. I, I wrote some papers, but the, my department was unclear if they'd be impactful, right? It took, you know, a while. It took more than the two years they were gonna give me to evaluate the success of NumPy. But in 2020, again, not because of my efforts specifically, because of others who took on this banner to help make, help make open source palatable in academia, uh, this paper was published in Nature Methods, which now has more citations than every paper I've ever published uh, on, on NumPy or SciPy. So it's really helped from a perspective of, oh, Google Scholar says, yeah, you're an academic now because you have a, this reference. Um, but it takes patience, it takes persistence, you know, and uh, uh, there's still a long ways to go. It takes collaboration. So I am patient, right? So that's partly, part of the secret is to just know and have, have conviction in what you're accomplishing, not blind conviction. Like I'm constantly updating and thinking, how do I do this better? But my conviction is in people, my conviction is in you, my conviction is in the power of cooperation and the power of serving others to make something better. So, and that's worth, that's worth driving. Um, uh, uh, it's worth working for. It's worth continuing to, to work and to deal and to struggle and to not have things go perfectly every day. Uh, so we're excited, I'm excited about that. So I'm gonna talk a little about Open Teams. Many people don't know much about Open Teams, partly because we've been quietly trying to incubate it, trying to understand what it is, trying to understand how we're gonna help everybody. It's a really ambitious idea, and it actually has three, three divisions, three segments. These are all separate companies, actually, uh, with leaders that are helping them grow. Um, so first, Quantsite Futures is the parent that kind of helps funding. It's basically a private equity, small private equity. I say that tongue in cheek, like I have a bunch of money. I have some, <laughs> and I keep funneling every uh, penny I can find into supporting these efforts. Um, first of all, there's an incubator. So incubator, we'll go into detail about that. Actually, Raven's here. She's helped organize PyData. She uh, is the VP of operations at incubator, so go say hi to her when, if you get a chance. Uh, that kind of is a sp help spin outs. It manages the fund. It's a venture services firm. It's what, I, it's what I'll be doing for the rest of my life, is helping there. Right, then Incubator has other spin outs. Essentially, and, it, and I'm kind of being borrowed as a CEO at Open Teams right now until I can find other people to help lead it. But Open Teams focuses on the, what we call an OSA network open source architect, open source uh, advisor, open source enthusiast. These are, this architect community is what we're driving in Open Teams. People with tech leadership skills, people with experience as project leaders, they might be maintainers, might be users, might be people, but people with significant experience that care about building better business solutions for open source, for using open source. Thousands and thousands of businesses are using open source today. Hundreds of thousands of businesses are using open source today. They need tech leadership that understands how to do it well, how to mix the right mix of product, how to mix the right, about how do you integrate with the open source community, how do you contribute back to the open source community. So our goal at Open Teams is to build this community of advisors and people who are ready Maybe, they're, maybe they'll be paid to do it, maybe they won't, maybe they'll work at their company, they may, may, may be looking for a job, maybe not. Probably a fraction, maybe only 5% are looking for, for work as an, as an advisor, and the others are looking to just exper uh, share ideas and share experience. So that's what we're doing, and then, then we also have a project success story. Um, so a few team members, uh, Matt, Braden, John, Raven I mentioned, Ines has joined us recently from the community management world, uh, Brian, Kate, these are, there's a lot more. But fortunately, I think there, we're up to about uh, 75 people that support us here. Uh, uh, again, with the, uh, on top of the 70 to 80 developers that we work with at Quantsite and Quantsite Labs and our other uh, companies. So again, um, uh, I need to look at the clock to make sure I don't go over. I wanna, wanna end with a few other slides. So I've got probably 10 more minutes. Um, if you're interested in talking about any of these things, partly the reason to show you is to come talk to me. I'm happy to explain. Incubator has an entrepreneur residence program. We're looking for people that want to create companies and start companies. Uh, actually, even before you know if you want to start a company, you just know you may want to. Uh, and there's, we call it entrepreneur residence program. We help you get that company started with the right uh, uh, kind of IP. Basically, it's the problem I had when I was starting. I, was, I, I, was a, 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 I had a family. 
I thought to start a company, I couldn't just eat ramen. I had to have a job. I couldn't go without money for a year or two years hoping to get a startup off the ground. So I had to work someplace. But usually when I work someplace, then the people who you work for don't want you to start a company because they want to own everything that you do. So how do you actually, you know, it's a little easier now in some organizations, but how do you square that? How do you make that work? Incubator is, is intended to solve that problem. And then when those companies start, it provides fractional services. The legal department, marketing department. Starting a company is hard. It's hard because you have to integrate more than you are. Like that's the hardest thing about it is it's much, much more than any skill you have and you're super skilled and you have to be super skilled in something, but you need more. You need to build teams of really skilled people that are even better than you across things you don't even know about. And so how do you do that? Well, you just kind of keep finding people to help you, finding partners. An incubator can help. Um, so then we have a venture capital fund, Quonset Initiate, that funds and invests in, we're on fund two now, we're looking to raise fund three uh, next year, and it invests in uh, companies either that are looking for technology, open source, or are looking, uh, open source technologists looking for marketing, sales, business development help. Uh, those two things we end up supporting. Um, Open Teams Global. So that's Open Teams Incubator. Open Teams Incubator has now spun out a venture studio company, which means it's a company that well, is being managed and run essentially from the incubator called Open Teams Global. And Open Teams Global has something called Open Source Professional Network. This is the original idea of Open Teams, rebranded, reengaged, and it's basically to create a talent network, a LinkedIn for open source creators, a community that's supporting open source careers. Uh, everybody in the world ought to be able to have an open source career and ought to be able to have people help them with an open source career. How do I um, sign contracts that have the right legal terms so I can have my contributions get back to the community? How can I make sure that I uh, find, find a good job where the, co the company supports open source and they're not just going to exploit my open source contributions, but they're, they're, they're collaborative, they're open source aligned. Uh, open Source Professional Network aims to help do that. Open Teams Global is an HR company, basically. Uh, I, say, I say this all the time, open source is a uh, global phenomena, people from all over the world work together, but employment is very local. Jurisdictions, I mean, when you're employed somewhere, you're interacting with the local tax codes, you know, local uh, organization folks, how do you do that? It's actually somewhat challenging. And so Open Teams Global is a potentially a global employment organization. Currently, we are only employing in certain countries, in other countries we help. We, we provide advice and provide staffing and provide HR services to folks who are looking to contract or work and develop in other countries. Anybody can, anybody can participate, but we're basically focused on open source aligned, open source creators, open source consultancies. Um, and it's uh, these two organizations, Open Teams Global and OSPN, not venture funded, not looking for venture funding. These are uh, bootstrapping, we're looking for potentially private equity or other investors who don't mind. Uh, I, we're not looking to scale these big and hope, you know, go, go big or go home, because uh, we're never going to go home. Open Teams Global and OSPN are going to be here uh, 10 years from now and we're gonna basically keep working to support people's employment efforts uh, across the world. Um, we have a great HR team, actually. We can only do this because of the great team that we've been able to pull together. Uh, these people are available to help recruit, find, employ, work across the world. Open Teams. I said Open Teams, its purpose is to, again, create this community of open source architects, tech leads, advisors, enthusiasts, uh, it doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter if you want a freelance job or not, you can join this network and actually work with like-minded folks. You do have to apply to the network. Open Source Professional Network, OSPN.org, open to everybody. Just no matter, you know, early, young, doesn't matter. The OSA community requires some experience. Um, right now, uh, it's me and two other people that are administering who joins. Uh, other people are welcome to join as we get more people in it. We'll have, we'll broaden the, the application process, but right now, um, this, this group is intended to help make open source better for business. Um, I was just at a, a dinner with a friend who works at a large bank, and he was telling me about his development team and the work they do. They have about, um, there's, a, there's, there's roughly, they could cut their development staff by at least half, is my strong belief. That if they would actually use open source more effectively, if they would actually use the people that are in open source communities driving, and there's things you have to do specifically, it's not just, you know, download open source software. It's actually engage with the communities and have some have the right kind of contracting processes. They could easily save half their budgets. And so there's a lot of money there available if we can organize correctly and engage with people correctly. So that's the purpose of Open Teams. Currently, our go to market is basically open source support. And you can go and we're learning, we're growing, we're still a startup. And this company is one that we believe could be scaled and, and grown with venture money. So, but um, we're working on that. 
Right now, the, you know, everyone here, you know, look at it, see if you want to apply. There are many, many people here that we absolutely welcome in the OSA community. Uh, so if you are interested in learning, we basically will have um, kind of one event a week, essentially micro events, you know, Zoom calls, conferences. We'll have a, a, a co-located boffs in multiple conferences. It's a way to kind of come together and exchange ideas and learn from each other. Um, you do, again, you do have to apply. If you're interested, seven years of experience, uh, one or two years of leadership experience on a tech project, that's kind of what we're looking for to, to get started. Uh, then you can come share in your area of expertise and other areas of expertise. This is open to not just Python, by the way. This is all open source. And so we'll have for forums and groups and various things like that that will organize within it. But that's what we're doing at openteams.com, actually, is that. And then we help people actually affect those, those change processes in an organization to create the world. Now, Quonsite, for example, is a partner of Open Teams. It's what we call an open source architect partner. And so, if, uh, and so there's a lot of s cooperative sales energy between the two. One of the ideas, one of the things that Open Teams, for example, is growing is something where I'm, I'm calling repos. It's a little bit of play on words. It's reimbursed enhancement proposals for open source. Uh, this is an idea we've been basically incubating for a long time. It's actually behind what's funded data APIs for us. Data APIs is this, go to data-apis.org. It's the uh, second attempt to unify arrays. <laughs> NumPy was the first. And now, of course, you know, 10 years later, there's many, many more arrays than the two that I started with to try to unify. Uh, not going to be able to unify them all, but not only a lot of arrays, there are a lot of data frames, too. And so Data APIs is a community effort. It's a group of uh, folks. Labs is a, is a main contributor. And then many, many people in the community, basically who are, and the funding for it has come from these ideas that we have for how to get companies to pay for open source. But the key thing about repos is it's got to be led by community maintainers. The community architects have to be the ones driving it forward. It's, it's, it's not us, it's not open teams, it's basically, hey, the community says, we want to move, the, move this, this community this direction, here's the feature set, here's the list of things, and open teams will help, well, great, let's go find funding. We use our sales and marketing efforts to go find funding. We've already identified three specific ways we can get funding, and we're looking, and we can, we'll keep exploring until we find many more. And then you get collaborative funding. Because a lot of times, you know, currently you try to get funding, it's like, okay, get that one company to spend all the money on doing it. But, okay, it's $250,000. One company may not be able to give you $250,000. Then maybe you can get 10 companies to give you $25,000. But then how do you organize that and coordinate it? So that's, that's, that's what we mean by repos. It's a, it's a way to organize our sales and resources to make this happen. All right, finally, um, last few minutes, I want to talk about what Quonsite's doing to, to enable this. Innovation, innovation requires iteration. All you want to innovate, there's much more innovation to go out there, as we described. To do it, you've got to iterate quickly. Like, it's not magic, actually. You basically can take somebody's curiosity, passion, couple it with tools, let them iterate quickly, and what do you know, things start to emerge if they cooperate with others. Um, there's usually compliance in organizations that are required, so it, it constrains this in some fashion. These constraints usually what creates all the technical debt that most companies uh, are, are weighed under. There's ways around that, though. Um, Nabari, many of you have heard of Nabari. Nabari is basically a Jupyter Hub distribution. It's a, and it's a, a DevOps tool that enables people to quickly uh, put something together and start exploring. Uh, we actually, for most of our organization, most of the people we go to consult with, we call it a reference architecture because it's basically an example of how you can do this. You could use it and keep using it, that's fine, or you can just learn from it and say, oh, we could do this in our organization. Um, and so it, it enables MLOps, data science MLOps, basically, with integrations to other libraries, uh, DAST, um, Notebooks as a Service is coming, uh, Argo, uh, ClearML, and others. Um, the challenge with iteration is that data, all of our activity, makes this stuff go so fast. We iterate so quickly, we create these very complex environments. So it's super easy to basically build it once and have it work on your machine. Right? And then go, and then now what? Right? Cool. But now the IT department says, I've got to have all these constraints, I have all these compliance requirements, now what do I do? I can't anticipate the libraries you want. Some people try to lock it down, and there's this basic distension we're all, all aware of. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, containers are part of the solution, but they're not the entire solution. Please, please, please stop using vendored wheels. I mean, that's essentially in one sentence my problem with current packaging is vendored wheels. They're, they're not needed. You don't need to do them, but so stop doing it. Uh, I, know why, I know it's tempting. I know you're hearing about it. I know that seems like the right way to go, and I know it's available, but it doesn't help you. It gets you something once. 
but then you, it's, it's technical debt effectively. And we constantly are encountering people who have this technical debt they have to unravel. Uh, that's one way to sum up the great work that Rolf has done in describing the pie packaging uh, discussion. There are best practices. Conda is one package manager. There are others. You know, there are other ways not to use vendor wheels than to use Conda. There are other ways. So I'm not just shilling for Conda. I like Conda. But there are other ways. But just use a complete package manager. Use something that lets you do this uh, for real. Um, and there's ways to do this better. We've taken these best practices and created something called Conda Store. Conda Store makes it basically focuses on the environment instead of the packages. So create the environment and then easily lets the teams of people use environments easily. So it controls the environment lifecycle, enforces best practices, manages versioned access controlled con environments. So there's UI, and basically it enforces reproducibility. Environment specification, so it starts with environment specification. So do that instead of con install packages, just change your environment. Then you create a lock file, um, update your lock file, and then you can create build artifacts from that, either in fully environments or Docker containers or just binary, a tar, tar, tar install. All right, I want to talk more about that. And I think I'm out of time. So I have some advice here, but I think I'm going to go quickly to one slide, which is basically code with a community. Care about people more than code. And you'll go a lot, lot farther. Uh, so thank you, everybody. I appreciate being here. And I, I'm going to here's to another 30 years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this amazing talk. It was really inspiring to, to know about your contributions and your promotions towards making the Python libraries and making it open source to accessible by all, all the people. Thank you. Thank you once again. Absolutely. Maybe it's time for questions. Hi, Travis. Hi. Oh, sorry, it is on. I just have to eat it more. Thank you for the talk. I, I'm hearing a consistent theme. This is my first PyData Data conference. I'm hearing this consistent theme of it's really hard to fund all these projects, which <laughs> you know has been the question I've had since I discovered open source back in 1999. My question is, does the federal government fund any of this? And if not, why not? Because great, great they question. fund all of research, and this is basic research. Yeah, yeah great question. Um, so I would say yes now, more than 10 years ago. And there's some great people in academia at, at NASA at the, at the federal uh, funded organizations that are doing a great job. I think it could be vastly improved still. I think there's still some, it's basically because of the heroic efforts of a few key people that they're doing it at all. Uh, some of this is just uh, social change takes a long time. You know, basically it's, it, it moves the pace of human life spans and human careers. Uh, people have a mental model and then it takes a while. It's changing because that mental model is changing. People are recognizing exactly your point. Right. Um, in fact, my view is if the federal government is funding software, it should, why isn't it open source? Rather than you know, make an excuse for it to be open source. It's like that should be the, the, the rule, not the exception. Um, but part of it comes from that question of, OK, people are saying, well, if you just produce open source, produce open source, how does it get sustained? And so that's a reasonable question. But again, there are some reasonable answers, actually. And I think it just takes some uh, uh, creativity, co collaboration, conversation. There's not just federal money. There's billions of dollars of federal money that's out there that, that could obviously be used to sustain, and some of it is now. The NASA grant, the ROSES grant, there's the European sp agency, there's, there's, there are, there's more. But it's a trickle compared to what's possible. Um, but there's at least $100 trillion of investment capital out there looking for investment. Meanwhile, open source is the foundation of most of the innovations of the past 10 years. That's a big disconnect. Right? That needs to flow better. It's, it is flowing to some degree. Venture funds are flowing it. There, you know, companies are flowing it. But I would say it's very inefficient still. But government absolutely could do a better job. I'm not the person to talk. I, I collaborate with the academic world to do that. But I think it's a good question. Anyone else? OK, thank you then. Absolutely. Thank you.